Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to Gender Equity in Sports During COVID-19, a review. Co-sponsored by the California Women's Law Center and Legal Aid at Work. This webinar is hosted by the Legal Aid Association of California, also known as LAC. My name is Erica Howard and I am the Trainings Associate here at LAC. We are the membership organization for California's civil legal aid nonprofits. Our job is to advocate in the legislature, in the courts, and with the State Bar of California on behalf of the community of nonprofits that serve low income Californians. In addition to our online and in person trainings, LAC provides coordination and advocacy for increased funding to support organizations like yours. Today's session is presented by Amy Poyer. Senior Staff Attorney at California Women's Law Center, and Kim Turner, Senior Staff Attorney at Legal Aid at Work. Before we get started, we want to mention a few logistical notes. If you're having any technical difficulties with the GoToWebinar system, please call 877-582-7011. If you have any questions about this specific webinar, you can email me at trainings at lackonline.org and I will try to get back to you before the webinar ends. Everyone on this call is muted, so if you have any questions, please feel free to send them using your chat box. The session will be recorded and materials will be posted online within three business days after the training. And now I will pass it off to our presenters. Thank you. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, let's move to our first slide here. Uh, so I'm Amy Poyer. I'm the senior staff attorney at the California Women's Law Center. And so happy to be here today with all of you. So excited you're all on um, and with my friend and, and colleague, Kim. And thanks again to LAC and Erica for hosting us. Um, we've got a great partnership and, and love doing trainings together with you and, and for all of you that are on. So just a little bit about uh, California Women's Law Center. Our mission is to create a more just and equitable society by breaking down barriers and advancing the potential of women and girls throughout the state. And we do this by utilizing litigation, engaging in policy advocacy, and educating attorneys and community members about our areas of expertise, um, like the trainings that we're doing, the training that we're doing here today. Um, we were founded in 1989. Uh, we were the first law and policy center statewide dedicated to pursuing justice for women and girls in all areas throughout the state. Um, we address a lot of different uh, issues related to gender equity, including economic security, violence against women, women's health, and gender discrimination. And one of our core areas of work under our gender discrimination pillar uh, is and always has been enforcing Title IX and specific to this webinar, Title IX uh, as applied to ath athletics and girls getting to play sports. And then before I kick it over to Kim, I just wanna say Kim and I both kind of always like to do this and, and start off our presentations by um, you know, just reminding everyone that for us, this isn't just work or academic or what we do, it really is our life and what we're passionate about. Uh, I am an athlete. I've played soccer nearly my entire life since I was four years old and my parents were so thankful that my energetic self was um, allowed to run around on a soccer field instead of around their house all day. And, uh, you know, up until this pandemic, I really had never gone longer than, than a month or two without playing soccer, basically since that time when I was four years old. And as we'll talk about a little bit more, you know, I really credit uh, playing soccer and being involved in sports with with a lot of the the passions and um, you know career paths that, that I have today. So uh, with that, I will kick it over to Kim, let her introduce herself and uh, the, our agenda for today, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Really pleased to be on today, and pleased that you're joining. Uh, as noted uh, from the slide, Kim Turner, Senior Staff Attorney and Project Director of Legal Aid at Work's Fair Play for Girls in Sports Project. And our organization is based in San Francisco. Legal Aid at Work has been around over 100 years and uh, Fair Play has existed almost 20 years. Uh, we concentrate within Fair Play on low-income girls of color and they're gaining access to an equitable playing field um, 
in terms of K-12 youth sports and schools, as well as K-12 park and rec sports. And uh, we're also focusing on even pre-K uh, since it's critical, as Amy alludes to, to get kids into sports as early as you can uh, to create that lifelong uh, practice of physical activity and healthfulness and teamwork that we get from sports. Uh, I'm also an athlete, played college volleyball, um, actually wouldn't have a volleyball team to play on in college, but for a Title IX lawsuit, they were going to cut the uh, volleyball program at my university, Brown University, and women uh, a few years before my time uh, brought a suit uh, to save the volleyball program and other women's programs and instilled a great amount of gender equity at the university. Uh, so I'm paying it forward constantly, trying to share the opportunities I got growing up and in school with others and make sure that everyone can play regardless of gender, race, socioeconomics. So really pleased to be here. Um, and Amy, if you wanna just add a, on our note, I'll pass it on to you. Oh yeah, um, so we just wanted to make sure right from the start to, to let everyone know that this presentation is not legal advice. We're not representing you. We're not giving you any advice that you should uh, rely on in any form. Uh, but instead, just giving you general information about uh, these important laws that are in place to uh, make sure that there's equity for girls at all level of sports um, in our state and in our country. So Kim, you wanna go through the agenda briefly? Great, yeah. So we like to give the X's and O's of our presentation. Uh, the, the game plan. Uh, we will be going fast through a lot of information today. So this, I understand, will be recorded so folks can check it out later on if they need to kind of slow down or review something. We're always available to chat if uh, folks want to hear something more in depth. We'll leave some time for questions at the end. Uh, but in terms of what we'll cover today, uh, we'll, we, we went through introductions. We wish we could hear from every one of you uh, in terms of who you are and how you come to these, these, these issues. Uh, we'll do a quick poll in a second to learn more about you. Um, benefits of sports for girls will be the next topic. Let's find out why we do this work. Why is gender equity and access to sports for girls so important? Um, and if you folks need the studies that we're gonna cite some statistics and some information, we're happy to send uh, studies and backup information to you all. Uh, then we'll talk about Title IX. What does that mean in terms of K-12 and collegiate sports? AB 244 would be our next topic, park and rec programming. Uh, specifically in California, we're, we're focused on that, but the, the lessons we'll review are transferable really to any community or any state. And then uh, tackling inequity, how do we eliminate inequity? Let's give you some ideas and tools for what to do about these issues of inequity that are persisting in, in our country and in our state of California. And then we'll talk a little bit about COVID-19 concerns and solutions uh, because we are in a really rare time right now with COVID and the pandemic. So. Uh, hopefully leave some time for questions. Feel free to chat a question if you have one as we go along. We might be able to answer it quickly as we go and then we could circle back at the end or email with you uh, or call, have a call with you in the future if needed and give general information, of course, not legal advice. All right, so I think we have our first poll coming up uh, in terms of wanting to know more about you. Uh, so Erica, if you don't mind triggering that poll, we wanna know more about uh, your, your kind of role. Um, are you, I can just read through it, or Erica, would you like to read through it? Go ahead. Okay, so we wanna know more about you. Which best describes your role? So please select one. You work at a school or school district, you work with parks and rec programming, you're an attorney, or you're someone else who just cares about equity. Of course, you could have a lot of hats, uh, but if you could just pick one and we'll open that poll and then close it pretty soon. Okay, so it looks like we have polls coming in. It looks like we have a couple people from school, school district, about a third from park and rec rate, um, over half as attorneys, terrific. You're gonna have your MCLE credits and uh, someone who cares about equity or a couple folks there. Of course, I'm sure that's everybody, uh, but you had to choose one. So thank you. That's a good sense of who you all are and uh, we'll get right into the substance. Great. There we go. All right. Um, so actually, we're gonna we're gonna keep your energy up and do our uh, second poll right now. So now we know, um, you know, where we're all coming from. A lot, a lot of attorneys, some park and rec on there. And now we'd like to know um, what's your experience with sports. So Erica, if you could pull up that poll number two. Um, so did you play sports growing up? Do you 
Did you play as a kid in high school, college, professionally, or you didn't ever play sports, which, which is okay too. Um, just curious uh, what your experience is with playing sports. So maybe pick the highest one that you did. I wish I put, played professionally. Um, one time I, I, I lived in, in London for a semester when I was in law school and I played on a team there and the coach paid half of my uh, train fare once to get back so I could get back in time from a school trip to play in the soccer game. So I think because I got those 10 pounds for that train ticket, uh, I had a brief career as a professional athlete. All right, um, great. So about a quarter of you played growing up, um, half of you played in high school, 20%, uh, one out of five of you in college. Um, wow, we've even got a, a somewhat another professional athlete on, on the line. Uh, and then if you didn't play at all, um, great. Thanks, thanks for answering that. You can you can pull that away. Um, great. So just to kick this discussion off uh, and, and make sure we're all on the same page, which the the vast majority of you um, all have played sports in some form. So. We probably are all on the same page about these benefits of playing sports uh, for young girls, but even, you know, I played sports my, my entire life and some of these things uh, I didn't know necessarily as well. Some are sort of intuitive and, and some are really interesting, I think. So educational benefits, health benefits, and employment benefits. So educational benefits. Girls who play sports are 20% more likely to graduate from high school They've got higher GPAs, higher scores on, on standardized tests. Um, and one that I really like, statistic that I really like, is they're 14% more likely to believe they're smart enough for their dream career. So that, that confidence that we always talk about of, of getting to play sports. Um, and about the same amount, 13% are more likely to be considering a career in math or science, um, which I love because I actually majored in math in my um, undergrad career in at UCLA. Um, don't don't ask how I became a lawyer. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but here I am doing doing what I love. Uh, health benefits. So I think these are things that we often think of when we think of benefits of playing sports. Obviously, you're you know you're running around, you're getting fresh air, lower rates of obesity for kids who play sports. Um, but this was an interesting one that uh, that I found: lower rates of breast cancer for young girls. Um, playing sports uh, as kids, lower rates of breast cancer as an adult. And then there are obviously the mental health benefits, um, which on a personal level is something that uh, was and remains very important. Uh, and one of the biggest benefits for me of, of sport and um, was as a teenager and, and still is now, lower rates of depression, um, more uh, confidence in general, as we talked about, and uh, less likely to engage, especially for, you know, kids, middle school, high school age, less likely to engage in other risky behaviors like, uh, you know, drinking, experimenting with drugs, um, lower rates of, uh, of teen pregnancy for girls that play sports. And then these are the really interesting ones uh, that I did not know about um, before, before starting this work, which is the employment benefits. Um, and this is particularly important, I think, for me in, in my role at CWLC because I can see from the other, uh, you know, all the other areas that we're, that we work in that women are already financially disadvantaged in so many ways um, as adults when it comes to the, the wage gap being overrepresented in, in low wage jobs, um, not having adequate, you know, access to paid parental leave. And you know other forms of discrimination that that affect women um, economically. So there was actually a study done that shows that women who are girls who play sports um, as children when they are adults make seven percent higher annual wages as adults, which is just an amazing uh, statistic. And the other one that I love is that ninety percent um, of executives at Fortune 500 companies, so the C-suite women. Uh, played sports growing up. So that's a, a huge correlation um, there. And given that all of you have played sports, I'm sure that we're all on the same page on all of these, but I always love starting these presentations uh, with those great statistics. Okay, let's move. Let's move to the fun stuff for all you, uh, the over half of the attorneys on the call, um, and those of you that like learning about the law too. So let's start with, with Title IX. Um, so Title IX is a, is a federal law, it's short for the um, 
Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, which means it was passed in 1972. This June, it will turn 49 years old. Uh, it will turn 50 in 2022, obviously. Um, and it applies to every state in the US. Some states might have uh, greater protections through their own state laws, but at a baseline, Title IX applies at every state. It applies to K through 12 schools as well as colleges and universities. A lot of times we hear people think uh, Title IX and this conception is that Title IX only applies um, at colleges and universities, but no, it applies at K through 12 schools as well. There's only one uh, triggering requirement uh, for an educational program, basically a school to trigger Title IX protection. And that is what you can see in the uh, italics right there is that they receive federal financial assistance. So that means even $1 of federal financial assistance to that school. A lot of it's, I've never seen a case where it's only $1, but technically $1 would qualify them. Um, so a lot of times people think private schools uh, aren't subject to Title IX, but they are so long as they receive $1 of federal financial assistance, which the vast majority of them do through things like federal um, programs like a free lunch program or um, grants, you know, FAFSA, FAFSA for, um, you know, colleges and universities utilizing um, federal grants uh, in that way. And then just a note, t Title IX covers any type of gender discrimination, uh, but educational programs and activities applies to athletic programs at schools. Um, so uh, just a quick read of the text, because I think it's important. I know we're trying to move quickly, but I really like to, to just read this out so people can listen to it. So no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So let's move on. Um, so what does that mean in the Title IX athletics context? So there's really three areas of uh, protection in the, the Title IX context um, for girls playing sports. So first there's equal participation opportunities. So this is gonna be sort of, don't be afraid, it's a little bit of math, but like I said, I'm a math major, I'll walk you through it. It's not that scary in math. Uh, then we've got equal treatment and benefits. And finally, anti-retaliation. You can't retaliate against someone for making a complaint or being involved in trying to secure gender equity at their school or educational program under Title IX. Okay, so let's dive in first to equal participation. Uh, so how can schools demonstrate that their school or that their students have equal participation opportunities? So these are, we talk about these as three different prongs to be able to show equal participation under Title IX and under the law, but it's really uh, the, the first one, substantial proportionality, is what, you, what we always go to first, that's the golden standard. If they aren't, if you aren't able to meet substantial proportionality, then you may be able to use the second and third prongs to as sort of uh, basically affirmative defenses to say, even though we're not substantially proportion, proportional, we still have equal participation opportunities for one of these two reasons. So substantial proportionality, proportionality say that five times fast. Um, so this is the one that involves some math. Again, it's not too scary, don't worry about it. Um, this just means that the percentage of athletes at the school who are girls or women is the same as the percentage of students at the school who are girls and women. Um, if they are not the same, if the percentage of athletes that are girls is less, then there is a uh, participation gap. I will show you how to calculate that in just a second. And uh, you would need to be able to show one of these other, one of the other two prongs to meet the equal participation piece. Um, so what are those other two prongs? Prong two is a history and continuing practice of expanding opportunities for female students. And I know uh, Kim has some, some thoughts on this as well. Uh, this, is, this was something that was added in uh, by the drafters basically um, for schools that were, uh, as we acknowledge, sometimes it takes some time to get into compliance. 
uh, for schools that were doing a lot of work before Title IX was passed or right after it was passed, were doing a lot of work adding teams, um, but still with all the work to do had not gotten to a, a 0% participation gap yet. It, as I just said, it's been almost 50 years since Title IX has, has been passed. Um, it is very, very difficult to show compliance with, with prong two and adding one team in the last 10 years is not going to do it. Uh, so very rarely is this uh, one a um, affirmative defense for equal participation that that works. Then we've got the third prong here, which is is the school fully and effectively meeting its female students' interests and, and abilities to participate in sports, um, or if the whatever the underrepresented gender is, are they fully uh, meeting those students' interests and abilities? And this um, requires a lot of work to meet this. Prong. This um, is something where you need to send out surveys to uh, all the, you know, students in the school and make sure that they, uh, there aren't any other sports that could be offered that would, that they are interested in playing, that there are, um, you know, something that, that is pretty fatal to using this defense is um, there being cuts on any girls' teams. Um, if girls are trying out for sports and not being able to make it, uh, the, the, it's hard to use this prong. So um, those are the three prongs of equal participation. And let me just quickly walk you through, ah, I know it's a lot of numbers, it's scary. Don't worry, don't worry. It's a lot of even numbers. Um, so at this fake school that we're gonna use as an, as an example, uh, luckily they have uh, very even numbers for us to use and we'll make this easy of how we calculate a participation gap or in personality. So at this school, we have a thousand students, half of them are male, half of them are female. What you want to focus on is the, the percentage of females in the student body, which you'll see um, pulled down, whoops, pulled down right here. Um, my cursor keeps disappearing. So 50% of the student body is female. Then we look at how many uh, students are participating in the athletic program at the school. This School has 200 students participating in the athletic program. 70 of them are female, 130 are male. So we calculate the percentage of students participating in the athletic program that are female. And that is 35%, as you can see there, 65% are male. So to calculate our participation gap, we take the percentage of uh, students at the entire school that are, that are female, and subtract from that the percentage of the entire number of athletes that are female. So that would be 50 minus 35. That's a 15% participation gap, which would be a fairly large, very large, I would say, um, from what we've seen. Uh, so this school would not be substantially proportionate. They would need to add 60 female athletes to become uh, to have a 0% participation gap. And they would need to show one of those um, other two affirmative defenses, which would, would likely be pretty hard for them to do. Um, see, that wasn't that hard. Math, math is fun. Math is fun. <laughs> okay, so that was uh, an example of the first, um, the equal participation. The second piece of Title IX athletic protection is equal treatment and benefits. And this is what we call the um, laundry list. These are all the items that we look at with equal uh, participation and, and benefits. Um, and I'll move through these fairly quickly. I could talk, I could probably spend an entire hour talking about all the, the differences that we've seen in, the, in these various um, items. But I'll just say that we look at all of these things um, under Title IX holistically so and not even just across each of these bullet items but across different sports too so one sport might have um, much better equipment and, and supplies for the the boys teams and the girls teams but if another sport has you know much better publicity and promotion there's there's an offset of what is the overall treatment um, of this gender in all these areas versus the this gender in all of these areas so equipment and supplies, you know, balls, bats, uniforms, huge issue, pra you know, practice jerseys, things like that. Facilities, um, you know, anywhere that games are played or that practices are held. So gym fields, practice fields, stadiums, 
uh, locker and team rooms. This is a big one. Uh, often the, the girls locker room is, uh, if there is one, is not in a, quite as good of shape as the, the boys locker room. Team rooms, we often see, you know, the boys football team gets their own team room and the uh, girls softball team has, does not have something like that. So what are we, what, what are we communicating to, to the girls about their worth when they don't get their own team room? Scheduling of practices and games, who's getting the, you know, nighttime slots, the most desirable slots, who gets to play under the lights, who gets to play uh, right after school so they don't have to go home and come back for, for practice. Coaching, this is both in uh, the number of coaches that, that are um, per, per player and the quality of coaches, um, which is important. Medical and training facilities, uh, things like weight room. Are, are we making sure that the weight room is, uh, is just as uh, attractive and inviting to female athletes as it is male athletes? What kind of pictures are we putting on the wall? Um, who are we inviting into there to, in there? Um, are we doing that in an equitable way? Publicity and promotion. This is things like the yearbook um, or, uh, you know, are they equal? equal pictures and and pages showing the the great things that each you know girls and boys teams are doing uh to things like uh you know morning bulletin shout outs are are the boys getting more of boys teams getting more of those are they always going first are they the ones um discussing specific team members for instance um travel and per diem things like buses uh are we getting a good the yellow school bus for the girls and a and a greyhound for the boys um, and then collegiate sports have a few additional items like uh, tutoring access, housing and dining services, um, and the recruiting dollars, which I'll, I'll talk about just briefly in a second. So this is just an example of, of a case that um, both Kim and I worked on and, and are continuing to work on. This is an example of a difference in, in facilities, of an inequity in facilities. Um, and I don't think I need to, to describe to you all the ways, all the differences in this, other than, of course, it looks like it was a, a sunny day for the boys' baseball field and not so much for the girls' baseball field, but dirt, you know, dugouts, uh, palm tree, you know, beautiful trees on, on the boys. Um, you can see all the, all the differences and inequities there. Okay, and then the, the last aspect, just really quickly, uh, retaliation. Um, no, you can't retaliate against uh, any of anyone who complains about a, an inequity or, or a Title IX issue, and that includes uh, students, teachers, coaches, staff. Uh, you can't bench a student who complains uh, uh, about inequities. You can't fire a coach who requests an investigation. You can't retaliate in, in any other way by taking, you know, a negative action against any of those people for complaining. And this is this is a, a big concern that we see a lot in all kinds of uh, sports gender equity cases that we work on um, of of people complaining that are, that are very worried about these very real um, issues with retaliation and we remind them that they are they are protected from that under the law okay and then I just want to very quickly before my my time is over I just want to talk about a, a study that CWLC um, helps with um, together with Champion Women, which is a, a great organization led by, some of you may know about it already, led by Nancy hogshead Makar, who is a former uh, Olympian um, and attorney now, and really focuses on, on collegiate sports. So what they did is compiled data from the federal government from 2019, from every single college and university in Division One, Division Two, and Division Three. It's over 2,000, and they calculated the um, basically the, the participation gap, the participation gap numbers for every single school. Um, and they also compiled athletic scholarship information, the lawsuit, which is a um, obviously a, a collegiate specific issue and not a not a K through 12 issue. Um, the differences in scholarship dollars because of the loss of those sports opportunities. Um, and they also looked at some of the, the recruiting dollars as well. And you can see the results here, um, 150,000 basically participation gap um, in collegiate sports and a $1 billion scholarship gap in collegiate sports. Um, and then there were some uh, pay discrepancies as, as well between the coaches. Uh, 
So this is just uh, an example. So what we, how we decided to attack this is to send a letter to each conference with their member institutions, outlining the gaps with their member institutions um, and reminding them this, this came up at the beginning of COVID because we were hearing a lot of uh, rumors basically about, uh, and news articles, to be honest, they weren't just rumors, but there were news articles, this was actually happening. Schools were starting to cut sports because they were having to put sports on pause and the same revenues were not coming in to them. And they were having to cut sports. And the rumor piece of that was that girls, women's sports were first on the list. And so we felt one, um, you know, sort of a two pronged approach that we wanted to stop that from happening. And two, we wanted to uh, use it as a chance to educate all of these universities and the conferences who are the ones that hold the keys to adding more sports and adding um, more teams about how out of compliance their member schools already were. Um, so we engaged in a, in a uh, significant letter writing campaign to every single conference in the in division one, two, and three and identified their gaps. So this is just an example um, of the uh, West Coast Conference, which has 10 schools that are uh, all on the West Coast. Uh, and the, you know, this, as an example, this conference had um, a 400 per women gap, which equaled out to about $4.5 million in uh, scholarship money as a gap. And the recruit, you can see 2.5 million would need to be added to recruiting of female athletes um, as well. So it, it was, I, I think the results of the study were surprising because people, a lot of people think collegiate sports when it comes to Title IX have sort of been fixed. And that was, a lot of the focus was on collegiate sports um, at, right after Title IX was passed, but it, it has not been fixed. Um, and the schools are continuing to uh, intentionally discriminate against women at, at every conference, every level, 90% of the school, of those over 2,000 schools, um, had participation gaps still. Uh, so it remains a, an issue at, in collegiate sports as well. And I will, um, there is a link to the full study that Champion Women did and all the data for every single college and university. If you're interested in learning more about it, um, I'll have uh, Erica and Lax send that out after the presentation. Um, so you can go take a look at that. And now I will kick it over to Kim to talk a little bit more about um, youth sports. Thank you, Amy. Terrific. Uh, and we promised we would move quickly and cover a lot. So feel free to chime in with questions or pause us if you want to go over something. Uh, so now I'm going to just talk a little bit about the, you know, positive impacts of Title IX. Just want to reflect, you know, Amy mentioned that there were obviously are giant issues still um, and noted those on the college level, but, you know, we do want to take stock of the progress made. So before Title IX in 1972, when the law was passed, less than 300,000 girls were playing at the high school level in the U.S., and now we're over 3 million girls playing in the United States. Uh, so we've made a ton of progress, but we actually uh, have about I think it's now 4.5 million around there boys playing nationally in the high school level. So we still have a, mil a million girl gap in our country at the high school level. And so I'm going to turn next to park and rec because park and rec sports are the way that girls get involved in sports from a, a young age. Um, you know, obviously it's hard to start a new sport in middle school or high school. You often got, you needed the experience as a six, eight, 10 year old to get uh, ready for school sports later on. And that's why Fair Play and CWLC work on AB 2404 compliance, and that's a California law. So I'll just go into you know, what generally that law is all about. Um, and for those of you who may not be in California or practice beyond California, you know, certainly we need more laws like this around the country. So you can be an advocate for passing such a law in your area. Washington State has a similar law. Um, you can see on the slide, it was passed in 2009. Uh, but there also might be state or local laws in your area that are like this, uh, AB 2404. So just take a look at your local, uh, you know, city, state, and obviously any federal ordinance and ordinances or constitutional, you know, sometimes state constitutional law can uh, impact this analysis. So California's AB 2404, we also call the Fair Play and Community Sports Act or Fair Play Act, and it was passed and signed into law in 2004, modeled after Title IX. So we went through all the Title IX background. 
Uh, and Amy, thank you for that, because uh, our AB 2404 law is, is very similar to Title IX and built off of that foundation. Um, so, so gender equity is required in youth competitive athletic programming in California uh, regarding participation opportunities and treatment and benefits that are run. Uh, so this is about athletic programs run by a park and recreation agency. Uh, you know, could be run by the city or a sub subset of the city, like an agency, uh, and then hosted. Those athletic programs for youth that are hosted through park and rec, third party leagues, are subject to the law. You, of course, you, you know, we're talking about public taxpayer dollars and public resources. They should be equally enjoyed by female youth um, and male youth and, frankly, youth of any gender. So let me also just say we are very supportive of LGBTQ people and youth. And so to the extent that we're talking about girls and boys here, please know that we're very much supporting, in, including all kids and people that want to play. So if people need resources on LGBTQ inclusion, I've gotten questions over the years on that. I'm happy to give resources in the future on that issue. But today we're kind of focusing more strictly on, you know, on girls and boys. Um, so we're talking also about um, kind of the big picture of AB 2404. Uh, one of the reasons we do this type of training is because I've worked with Park and Rec for over almost 10 years now, and many of them just don't know about this law. They're not tracking gender. They're not thinking about these issues. And frankly, there's not a lot of training out there. So we really enjoy doing this because we want people to understand the obligations. We want families and girls to know their rights. Uh, so we're just trying to help. Uh, and, and so, yeah, next slide, please. Okay. So just, you know, as we went over Title IX's actual language, here we have some actual language from AB 2404. It's a very simple law. Anyone could just pull it up on the internet. It's not very long. It's not that complicated. But it, it strictly says, you know, and there's more, more to it than this, but it, at its heart, it says no city, county, city and county, or special district shall discriminate against any person on the basis of sex or gender in the operation, conduct, or administration of community youth athletics programs. Uh, in the allocation of park and recreation facilities and resources that support or enable these programs. And so, you know, this is common sense. We talk about Title IX, you know, gender equity and athletic and educational programs. Now we're talking about community programs. It's, it's common sense that, you know, girls and female youth should have that chance to play. And when they do play, they should be treated equally. Sadly, we see a lot of inequity, major, major inequity in community youth sports programs and in school programs. Uh, still, even though Title IX is almost 50 years old, we have a lot of work to do on this. Uh, we see uh, softball fields, for example, in, in park and rack in cities that are far worse than the baseball fields. Um, these are public properties, but baseball often gets the best fields. They get the lights at night. They get um, snack shacks, you know, better parking, bathroom, bathroom access. Girls are often lacking bathroom access at their softball fields. Um, they don't have exclusive use of their fields. Boys often do those types of things. So we can fix this. It's not rocket science. Um, the law is clear and what we need to do is often very clear. It just need a little training, a little effort. Um, so AB 2404 uh, was preceded by a lawsuit in Los Angeles called Baca v. City of LA. And uh, that was in the 1990s before this law was passed. And their um, girls softball in particular within the city of LA was experiencing a lot of gender inequity and they weren't getting fields and resources. And there were only about 20% girls uh, opportunities afforded throughout the city park and rec programming. So there was a, a, you know, kind of a landmark case there that, you know, I think inspired AB 2404. And, and that's also to mention that even if there isn't a law like AB 2404 in your area, if you're beyond California, um, there still may be, again, other uh, laws that could be triggered and requiring that park and rec to be gender equitable. Um, okay, so next slide, please. Good news is City of LA uh, has done a lot of work to bring participation and resources up for girls. Uh, you know, uh, and in fact, I think they have some, some models in LA City, not warranting them on AB 2404 compliance per se, but I do know that they're working hard on these issues. I've trained with LA City on these issues and I'm happy to give you any of their model uh, policies or uh, you know, tactics that they've used to bring up girls' participation. They have a great initiative called Girls Play LA and uh, I think it's been quite successful. So under California Park and Rec equity law in, in our state of California, um, it, it's basically substantial proportionality, just like with Title IX. If girls make up 50% of the area population, the city population, they should make up about 50% of the athletic opportunities that are run by Park and Rec or hosted by Park and Rec. Now, let me just be clear, Title IX and AB 2404, it's about the underrepresented gender. So, you know, there are 
very occasionally, for example, in schools, very, very rarely, I do sometimes see, okay, boys are underrepresented in the school and girls have more opportunities. It's very, very rare, but it happens. So Title IX and AB 2404 are about gender equality, not about girls per se or boys per se or this or that. So, you know, I just want to be clear that it's about underrepresented gender and, and those folks. Um, and, you know, I like to, to note that because, it, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of usable by everybody. And, and the idea is, um, you know, the, the, that equity should be afforded to everybody no matter what. Um, so the city, if they don't have that 50-50 kind of gold standard that Amy talked about, that prong one substantial proportionality, they could show that they've met all the interests of the underrepresented gender, which is almost always girls. Um, they're, you know, we've done studies and reviews and we're seeing that girls are often like 20% or 30% or sometimes as low as 10% of the opportunities in a city in the park and rec programming and the third party leagues. And yet we know that girls want to be playing in way greater numbers. I mean, almost every survey I've ever seen says girls want to be playing in far greater numbers, but the cities uh, in park and rec or a school is just not making space for girls at the athletics table. There's not enough seats for the girls at these athletics tables. And, uh, and then when they do play, they're facing inferior conditions. So that is forcing girls out of play. If you're a softball girl that has a much worse field than your brother down the street who's playing Little League Baseball, you know, you feel inferior and it's really aggravating and it may discourage you from going back next season. So treating girls really well or just treating them equally to boys in their sports opportunities brings participation up and reinforces participation. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we do have LGBTQI inclusion resources as needed. I'm getting more and more questions on that these days, and that's great. And I'd love to support any questions on that in the future. Um, okay, so next slide. I will just quickly mention that prong two, Title IX's prong two, continued history of expansion, uh, continued history and practice of expansion. That was actually a defense for Park and Rec uh, for 10 years, from 2005 to 2015, they could say, well, we're working on it. We had 10% girls in programming for athletics, competitive athletics. Uh, we had you know, a very small number of girls, but now we have 40%, we're working on it, we're getting toward 50%. That, sun that defense has been sunsetted as of 2015, because they realized we, we shouldn't have that defense and that excuse, the we're working on it excuse forever. Um, and then actually, Amy, if you can go quickly back to the last slide, I just realized I want to show that, you know, in terms of that proportionality, if you don't have a 50-50 ratio, so if girls are not 50% of your athletic opportunities in your programming in a park and rec or in your third party leagues, then you can show that you're meeting all the interests of girls. Um, but you know, you have to survey, you have to track gender. A lot of, unfortunately, cities I've encountered don't, don't even track gender. So they have a law that they have to abide by, uh, but if they're not even tracking gender of participants, it's gonna be very hard to show that you're meeting the, the, the requirements of the law. So you have to track gender. And then if you have an underrepresented gender, you know, such as girls, survey them and ask them what they wanna play and why they're not playing if they're not playing. And the surveys 99.9% .9 of the time are gonna show, yes, we want more soccer. Yes, we want more volleyball. We want all girls teams. We don't like co-ed teams because we, we never get playing time or we're not getting the ball. Um, so there's just so much to do and work on here. And it's just a matter of being proactive. Okay, next slide, thanks. All right, so as I mentioned, you know, youth sports work to do. Uh, 4.5 million plus boys are playing nationwide at the high school level. And then there's just 3.4 million girls. Uh, you know, that's like the last stats that we have from uh, the Nas National High School uh, Association. And then in terms of that million girl gap, I mean, it's very closable. I will say that the data I've reviewed shows that there are some states that have a very small if not uh, their non-existent gap between girls and boys at the high school level. And then there's states that have enormous gaps. Um, you know, there's one Southeastern state that offers girls, uh, I'm sorry, boys twice as many opportunities as girls in the high school level. So it's clear that, you know, and yet there's a, a, another state that has basically parity between girls and boys in high school sports. So we know girls want to play and can play. It's, it's just a, a matter of making sure they feel welcome, equally treated. And then we start at the park and rec level so that they you build that foundation of sports uh, ability and interest okay so in terms of park and rec what do we have to do there um, half of park and rec that we surveyed a few years ago did not know the numbers of girls and boys and you know the gender of those playing so knowing is more than half the battle please you know for those that are in those roles find out from from your park and rec leagues 
and then your third party leads uh, what the gender is of those participants. And you don't have to get sensitive personal data about the family. And some people decide not to say the gender if they're reporting, but you know, just big picture numbers is, is often all you need to figure out, oh my goodness, we only have 16% girls in program. Why is that? We can work on that. That we, we must work on it because there's a law that says we need to be uh, proportional or meet all the interests of girls. Um, and then self-reported data showed from our review that you know, often it was about one third girls in community sports and two third boys. So when we did get data, it was a, you know about 33% girls in the programs, and and girls wanted to play much much more. And then I said there's one department that had just 10% girls in their programming for park and rec, and that is like, you know, to me a, a 1921 number, not a 2021 number. We really need to step into this modern era, and we know girls want to be playing sports, and there's all those lifelong benefits of play but we really need to make sure that they're accommodated, welcomed, um, and reinforced when they do play. Okay, next slide, please. So what do we do about all this? You know, we talk about the struggles and the challenges, but we often wanna leave folks with ideas for what they can do. As I said, this is not, you know, legal advice, but I can just share with you, these, these are steps we've seen um, in other cities and schools work well for getting girls into the game. Every area is different, every school, every park and rec is a little bit different. Uh, but some of these skills are very transferable, very um, commonsensical and, and low to no cost. So audit program, count your girls, boys, the, the gender of your youth, uh, find out what, you know, who's out there. I mean, of course, there's other aspects of this, you know, um, in terms of socioeconomics, for example, we help low income girls of color in our project. And, you know, how many scholarships are you giving out? Are you, are you discounting low income girls of color who need scholarship access, you know, and, and I find there's some cities that have scholarships, but they don't advertise it very well or families don't know how to apply or the application process is difficult so just audit who's out there who's using your resources your public resources and how can you make sure there's more inclusion um, survey uh, the underrepresented gender ask them what they want to play why are they not playing so i have a survey on our fair play for girls in sports website that we've crafted and please check it out i can send you a chinese and spanish version of it we have the english version on our website it's a three minute survey. Families of girls could answer it very quickly and you can find out, oh, is it transportation is the barrier or field assignment or safety at the location? You know, sometimes it's something small like the porta potty didn't work last season. So we don't wanna go back and play this season. You can fix that, that's fixable. Um, use active recruitment strategies, you know, even just seeing all these pictures of girls in our, in our slideshow here, you know, just having pictures of girls in their flyers. I mean, that's often the, a problem where I see schools and park and rec that don't have pictures of girls in their, you know, sign up sheets or um, aren't using female leadership like female coaches, female officiants uh, to advertise and recruit and promote the programming. So that helps a lot. Use your networks and partnerships. So maybe you have a local nonprofit that serves girls in soccer or running program or a girls basketball program. Find out what they're doing, uh, replicate their successes, you know, bring them to the city council meeting or the school board meeting and find out what they're needing and, and who they know and, you know, just loop them in, get them connected, make sure you're in touch with them. Uh, recruit female role models. I mentioned coaches, female coaches, female officiants. It's super powerful to have uh, those folks involved in the leagues, in the, in the school team, you know, wherever it may be. And uh, offer single sex and co-ed programs. So, you know, I've seen a lot of cities, obviously sports are generally sex segregated in K-12 schools and college, but in park and rec, I see a lot of co-ed program where girls don't feel included or welcome. And I think when, when they add all girls programs and promote them properly, make sure they have the same quality uniforms, make sure that they're, you know, equally treated, not like a second class program, but single sex, for example, girls basketball, I see being really successful because girls feel a part of it and, and, and centered in, in the activity. Whereas I found a lot of co-ed programs, girls are just really, you know, one of 10 players. And then, you know, I played a lot of co-ed sports growing up. I love sports. I was sort of a tomboy. I have an older brother. It was comfortable for me, but I find there's a lot of girls and women that don't really appreciate that space of, of co-ed. It's just not, not for them. So we have to make sure that we're uh, catering to those girls in the way that makes sense to keep them in the game because it's important they play, it's great for them to play. Okay, considering language access, culturally informed outreach, um, you know, that's a no brainer, but I, I've dealt with Parks and Rec in certain areas where they realize, oh, we need to be putting our handouts in a certain language or putting our, our posters in a certain, or our banners in a certain part of town where folks may not know that they can play soccer, um, you know, make sure that everything's accessible, uh, social media, audit these things, look at your flyers, look at, 
you know, is there is there a handout at the library that's in Spanish and English about girls sports? You know, it's kind of simple stuff, but uh, really goes a long way. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, so a few more, and you know, we said we'd, we'd give solutions because they're, you know, it's critical to think about these things. And you can do these things today, tomorrow, next month, a year from now. You know, sticking with it, as I mentioned at the bottom there, is so important. It's not about one-off, um, you know, action steps. You've got to, you've really got to stick with it. So starting at the top there, utilize men and boys as equity champions and allies for girls. Uh, be inclusive of all genders and identities. You know, just one thing is, you know, maybe the local mayor of your town uh, or the principal of the school is is a man. You know, I've seen it be very powerful for that, you know, say that the male mayor of your town, the council member, goes to the first girls basketball game of the season, is is helping with tip off or the first pitch at a girls softball game. It's very powerful for the girls to see, you know, the male leadership of the town saying you matter just as much. This is, you know, your tournament, your game, your kickoff. I'm here. I'm supporting you. I'm rooting for you. Um, so that kind of thing. Obviously, if, you know, a female mayor of the town throwing out the first softball at the big, the big opener for softball that that season, it's big. It, it, it says this matters. This matters to us. The pep rally, the school homecoming, all those things. Make sure you have men and boys, girls and women equally kind of cheered for, and and the the leadership is there too. Identify and remove uh, the barriers to girls' sports participation. So one quick example here, um, I had a, a city that found out that girls just wanted to play with a friend. The thing that they wanted to, was to play with one other girl that they knew. They don't want to sign up for the new basketball team unless they knew one person. And so to me, that's almost a no cost solution where you can say we have a buddy system. So if you're going to try this great new sport, girls, you'll know one person and, and that'll help you maybe feel more comfortable trying something new. So sometimes the barriers are, are just so simple and so removable. Um, and then I also find a lot of places, schools and park and rec where girls didn't even know that they could sign up for sports. They didn't know that there could be a JV soccer girls team. They said, oh, I'm not going to make varsity. I can't try out. Well, let them know that there's going to be more levels. If there's girls that show up, they're going to they're going to have more levels of the team. Or let them know that, you know, the school or the park and rec can provide a soccer ball. If the girl doesn't have a soccer ball in her home, maybe there's a local sporting goods store that would give girls a soccer ball to practice at home. You know, little things can make a, a big difference. Apportion local funding equitably. So solicit donations and in-kind benefits to equalize as needed. So maybe baseball put a lot into their field. Well, make sure that the school or park and rec is saying, well, let's look at softball. You know, you might have your own funds to, to equalize things, but if not, then sometimes a local business leader um, could make a, a donation to make sure that things are equalized. Of course, it, regardless of the source, it should be equal. And, and you know, the, the lesson is you should not let a booster make a really nice boys baseball field for your city or your school and leave softball behind, leave girls sports behind. So there has to be a lot of, um, watching the store in terms of girls and boys sports donations, make sure that everybody's equally benefiting. Try new ideas, think outside the box. Sometimes the solution is really surprising and different. You know, I, I am not a sports management expert, I'm a lawyer. I do coach youth sports and I played sports, but you know, often the ideas are just something you didn't think of. Uh, and so be resourceful, talk to all your staff, talk to the community members, the families, the girls, ask them what they need and uh, be, be creative. Uh, be persistent. I just can't say this enough. You know, I see some schools and parks and rec say, okay, we'll have one training on this and we've got it. Or we'll have two meetings on this and, and we're set. No, it's going to take, you know, a task force. It's going to take an audit each year, you know, things like that. It doesn't have to be, you know, really complicated, but just look at the numbers of girls playing each year. Are you making progress, you know, each year? Are you giving girls what they need to feel equally part of your community, your school or your park and rec? It's not that hard but you do have to stick with it. And you can't just offer girls softball one season. Oh, we didn't get many signups and quit. You know, it's gotta be, okay, did we get good coaches? Did we advertise? Let's try again next year. You know, girls and women's sports uh, are way behind boys and men's sports because there's been discrimination for really thousands of years, if not longer. So we really need to, to jumpstart um, equity for girls and put in a lot of time and effort to make sure that there is equality and it's absolutely doable. I just want to give you some hope that there are schools and parks and rec that are treating girls very much equally out there. And so um, this isn't rocket science and those lessons can be replicated and I'm happy to give more ideas to people who need them. I'll just go on to that last slide before we wrap up and take, qu take questions. Okay, so we talked about COVID a little bit and Amy, thank you for touching on that in the college level. 
Um, I will say that with athletic pause in many communities, um, this is the downtime sometimes to assess inequities. You know, maybe your, your, your leagues aren't happening, your coaches are not working on the fields and in the gyms right now. So you can use the pause to gather tools to improve gender equity. We have a lot of resources, toolkits, and videos. Um, use the time to train up your staff, coaches, youth, families, partners about gender equity. And then when you reopen, ensure gender equity in your offerings uh, with short or long-term plans, um, well, really both short and long-term plans for lasting equality. Um, it, it is a patchwork quilt right now across the country. Some areas are doing youth sports, some are not. I do have a quick poll if we have time uh, just to find out in your area if sports are going on. I don't know if Erica can pull up our last little poll here. And then we'll have just a few minutes for questions. Um, go ahead, Erica, if you don't mind. Thank you. So how has COVID affected sports in your community? Are they paused? Are they continuing as before? Are they somewhat paused? And you, or you don't know exactly, maybe you're not in that space right now. So please just vote on that. And then we'll have time for maybe just one or two questions and feel free to contact us later on if you have more to chat about. We really appreciate your engagement. All right. So it looks like 17% youth sports pause. Um, not, no one's continuing as before. That makes sense. This pandemic is so rough. Youth sports are somewhat paused and si nearly 60% and then a quarter of you don't know. So that's fine. But yeah, everything's very different right now, but we wanna emphasize that this is the time to work on equity because we are in that reset space. We can use this as a reset. It's not easy right now, but if you can use this time to take stock. Okay, last slide please. And we'll get our contact information out there. Any questions for us, Fair Play, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. California Women's Law Center as well has Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, so Kim, we, we did get one question. Let me uh, read it oh, out. Great. Go um, ahead. If a, if a county park leases the park to a private nonprofit soccer organization, is there any responsibility to check compliance with Title IX? It says Title IX, but I would, I would imagine that or the Fair Play Act. Yeah, so third party leases are definitely subject uh, to AB 244 if it's like a park and rec youth community sports league or, you know, Title IX would be implicated if a school is using the space, a uh, public school that accepts federal funding. And so we often tell people your space is public. If it's a public gym, field, um, you know, building, it's, it's public and thus subject to AB 244 or Title IX. So absolutely third party entities that use these spaces for youth sports should be accountable under the law as well. And sometimes third party leagues need to come to these trainings so that they can get this information and be part of the solution. So happy to um, share with anyone after the call, after the presentation resources for how to engage with third party leagues. But thank you for that great question. Amy, anything to add on that? Uh, no. Okay, yeah. Any other questions folks wanna ask? While we're waiting, I just want to quickly note that, um, you know, there's no football exception in Title IX. We do sometimes, unfortunately, hear people say, well, we have a huge football team, 100 boys on the team in our high school. You know, isn't, isn't that accepted from Title IX? It's absolutely not. I mean, football is fine. You know, we're all supporting boys and girls sports and all sports. But just because you have 100 boys in football doesn't mean you shouldn't balance out opportunities and have three or four levels of girls volleyball. Um, for example, we did a case in Los Angeles where, you know, girls were signing up for volleyball, but they wouldn't create more than one or two teams and they turned away about 75 girls from volleyball. Well, you can usually find competition if, if the sport's popular in your area. There's no reason, in my opinion, that, you know, girls shouldn't have 100 volleyball opportunities. I've seen schools that have four levels of soccer for girls because they know it's popular. So just make sure not to let football be accepted, you know, in any way. They're just like every other sport. And then uh, third party boosters. I made the point earlier that, you know, if you have donations, they should be vetted um, and make sure that those donations are coming in to equally benefit all youth in your sports programs. Um, so I know we're near time. Any other questions or wrap up from Amy, Erica? Erica, you wanna wrap us up? Thanks so much everyone for being here. Um, sorry we talked really fast, but obviously we have a lot to say on all of this and I uh, hope you guys learned something and feel free to follow up uh, with us if you have additional questions or think of things after the presentation. Yes, thank you, everybody. Definitely, thank you all. And thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Gender Equity in Sports During COVID-19, a review. Thank you to our presenters for sharing this training with us.
We will distribute materials and MCLE certificates after reviewing today's in-session times. You will likely receive them within three business days. You can find more information about LAC's programs and benefits by visiting our website, www.laconline.org, or by following us on Facebook and Twitter. You can also email us at trainings at laconline.org with any questions about our online and in-person trainings. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Good day.